she enjoys him the way the audience enjoys him. She finds him frightening and scary sometimes, but they've seen Breaking Bad. Kim has not seen Breaking Bad, thank God. Hi, I'm Saul Goodman. Did you know that you have rights? The Constitution says you do. Peter and I would take these long walks around Toluca Lake in the waning days of Breaking Bad. Are we gonna do this? This spinoff, let's do it. The only thing I had to say about that was that you're gonna have to make him likable. Better call Saul. He was fun because in the context of Breaking Bad, he was having a good time. And I said, but if he's gonna have his own show, this is not a guy that you can care about. So they had to figure that one out and they did. This isn't slipping Jimmy. Fine. I was working with Brian Cranston at the time when they were cast, he's kind of the one who alerted me. He said, yeah, I think they're going to make this. You should do this part of it. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Are you proud of me? Hmm? Oh. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. One of the things that fascinated and surprised me was the pride that Michael brought to the character. I remember going back to the writer's room and we asked, what does this guy who is so brilliant think of having Slip and Jimmy for a brother? And this is not something that we planned. I think that's led to a lot of what ended up being the show. He's capable of this, you know he is. I know he's not perfect. And I spent the first couple of episodes praying that I'm not dead in the next episode. <laughs> Because I didn't know how long I was there. They didn't come to me and say, like, she's going to turn out to be the girlfriend and the love interest and then appear to be a moral compass and then be way more complex than we ever thought and have these dark sides. The next words out of your mouth ought to be the truth. I know that Nacho was initially supposed to be an antagonist uh, moving into season one. And I was really weary about playing a stereotypical character. However, in the description of Nacho were, were words like intelligent, like someone who would not squash a bug with a sledgehammer. Like there was all these really intriguing things about nuanced things about the character. I thought I saw his potential from the time that Jimmy was in the men's room at the courthouse. I thought, this is good. And then it just got better and better and better. Probably around when Chuck dies, it's sort of an undeniably well-constructed universe. The fact is, losing such an important character, it means that that world is has its, its own cosmology that's closed off uh, separate from Breaking Bad at that point. I had kind of suspected that this would go off the rails, that there was going to be something that would snap back on Jimmy and make him into the Saul Goodman we came to know and love. Oh, don't you fucking old Jimmy me. You look down on me, you pity me. He's haunted by Chuck. And when he sees Howard, he sees Chuck looking at him from beyond the grave and going, I know who you are. Before you make any big changes in your life, there's something about Jimmy you ought to hear. You know, the last scene I did was with Kim. We're in the courthouse and I'm really trying to warn her off about Jimmy and she, she laughs at me. <laughs> I hate that Kim Wexler laughing at me. And it wasn't until I watched it that I really uh, got the, the weight of that final scene when Kim is starting to like sharpen the steak knives. It's a great reversal from the end of season four because Jimmy's now the one sitting on the edge of the bed and Kim's got all these ideas. Initially, it feels like she's playing along with Jimmy as he fantasizes hassling Howard more. Kim doing this, then, you would not be okay with it. Not in the cold light of day. Wouldn't I? And then she keeps going past where he feels safe. She's been quite menacing. How much of it is sincere? How much of it is playful? How much of this is just in defiance of him forcing her to accept a third party into their relationship for this whole season and saying like, oh, guess what? There's another side to me, deal with it. That's why he calls me the magic man. I do think the mystery at the core of the show which for a long time was, who is Saul Goodman? Who is Jimmy McGill? But I think the mystery now at the core of the show is, who is Kim Wexler? You want to understand what I'm talking about? Follow my lead. As the seasons went on, the thing that brought Jimmy and Kim together as a couple was scamming together. Giselle St. Clair. And Kim loves doing that. Why she does, if there's something more to say about her, her past, we're still mulling over. Even your lousy days are more interesting than my good ones. Yeah. The Jimmy and Kim relationship to me is super rewarding, owed in huge part to the fact that they al actually allow us to evolve. There's so much history there and they let us play it in those small talks because in real relationships, the real stuff happens while you're talking about making eggs. 
I think the hardest moment in the season between the characters was played by Ray Seahorn, who suggests that maybe they should get married. Kim is actually not very good at emotional stuff. Either we end this now and enjoy the time we had and go our separate ways. And when presented with emotional circumstances, she does try to force them over into a pragmatic, problem-solving situation. Clearly, it's ludicrous, but it's born of emotion that became so tight in her throat, she can't keep speaking, so she switches. Maybe we get married? We don't know everything, but we know a lot about what happens to Jimmy McGill. But what happens to Kim Wexler? Why isn't Kim Wexler on Breaking Bad? Was she at home waiting for Saul Goodman? Before this season, that would have seemed pretty outrageous. Now, I think it's actually, it's almost an open possibility. I did start to think last season, or maybe even after Chuck dies, I thought, well, it's not necessarily the most tragic thing for her to just be picked off, like kill, to just kill off everybody that's not in Breaking Bad. That's probably not the most interesting, and it might not even be the most tragic thing that could happen to her. I say that and then watch, like I'll be dead, who knows? <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you kidding me with this? And at this point, I feel like she is more dangerous to herself than anything. <laughs> Well, I guess the drug cartel coming after you is pretty dangerous, but um, but still, those are choices she made. I make my own decisions. I was doing something with Ray Seahorn. We were talking and they were asking like, what's gonna happen to Kim Wexler? And I said, and I meant this, and I said, oh, I still think Howard could save her. And she goes, I don't need saving. And I'm like, wow, I've so missed the point of the entire show being in the eyes of Howard Hamlin. Poor Howard. I, I, I pray for Howard next season. It's not my fault that I got ambushed. Why did I have to lie to Salamanca about that? Vince used to say, you're getting uh, two shows for the price of one. You're getting the Jimmy McGill show and you're getting the Mike Ehrman track show. I'm not done with Hector Salamanca. For the last few seasons, I was like, when are these people gonna meet? And then finally this season, and I think a lot of it had to do with the introduction of Lalo. You know, I think Lalo was a character that is so important to the show. You couldn't get a better person and actor to play him than Tony. Is there any chance, and I know the answer is probably no, but is it possible for me to meet the owner? I am the owner. Really? I, I wanted to show this other side that's, you know, to get away from the cliche of these, you know, bad guys that have this serious face. This guy could be a little more charming. This guy could be a little more carefree than they're used to having in this show or even in this world of Breaking Bad. No, it wasn't me, it was Ignacio, he's the one. In uh, the first episode where Saul Goodman appears in season two of Breaking Bad, he makes some throwaway line. Lalo didn't send you, no Lalo. Who? Oh, thank God. And I was ready to just say, oh, the hell with that, who cares? <laughs> who cares? We don't need to explain that. And Peter and the writer said, we gotta explain that. I mean, who the hell is this Lalo guy that you're so scared of? And when you meet Lalo, you're like, well, he seems like he's not that bad. We'll get to that. So I think something pretty bad's gotta go down for this guy to um, pee in his pants when he hears the name of my character. I'll find a way, I'll make him trust me. Every single avenue seems to be an opposing force. Why do you keep interrupting the interview, buddy? I think he really wants to be an actor. I used to think it's a story of redemption until the end of this season, and then I, I realized maybe it's a story of emancipation. Maybe it's a story of liberation, of liberation from oneself, from, from everyone that's pulling at you and from becoming your own man. So maybe it's a bit of both. I am what I am. For me, I have a different route. Jimmy McGill has a thousand words, and for me, I don't have a thousand words. I have to allow you to see what I'm doing and the torment that Gus goes through in regard to revenge for someone that he lost in his life. My way in was to see and find elements of a character that we'd never seen before. I am different. For me to have taken these building blocks and created someone who can be looked at like a villain, but yet you see the flip side of their humanity was very important to me. And I felt like that was a nefarious, villainous character that we had never experienced before. Die! quiet. Why? I'm quiet. I'm loud. I'm going to die in this dirt one way or the other. Let's get it over with. Saul and Mike in the desert is just incredible to me. It allowed us to really get inside both of those characters in a different way and for us to feel the edginess of the cartel's reach. If I'd been in the writer's room, I would have said, no, this is way too hard. This episode you intend to give me. I, I don't. This is no. You gotta have a scene by a pool somewhere. You gotta have, <laughs> have more indoor scenes in the air conditioning. Big mistake. 
just continuing. And this thing was the single hardest thing I've ever doing. This one episode of TV. Torturous. <laughs> how about torturous? That's how it was. Jimmy has had this guy shot two feet from his face. Same guy gets run over. And then he has to do this slog through the desert. And I think he's just a basket case. It becomes monumentally tragic because Mike is very aware of the choices that he made. Mike has to live with himself, and that's not an easy thing. You're in shock. You stay here and breathe. What Mike's Achilles heel is, that he sees Jimmy's vulnerability. Begrudgingly, maybe, but is sympathetic to Jimmy. So what's wrong? It's, it's over. I'm not looking forward to it ending. I'll be the first one bawling. I want whatever they think is the best ending for her story, whether that means literally like she ends <laughs> or they open a new can of worms as far as like questions about whatever, where she went or whatever. Whatever it is that they're gonna do, um, I'm as excited to read it and then sit down and start sweating about how to play it as people are to watch it, <laughs> if not more so. We owe you, if you need a favor, I'm your man. We've got this really smart guy who is a bit of a wild card. And Gus has a problem with wild cards, just as he does um, with Don Eladio. And so Lalo Salamanco is a wild card. That explains everything. I have high hopes <laughs> that something really wonderful will happen between us and our relationship. It's you. First of all, Jimmy's story isn't done. He's Gene Takovic when he's in hiding, and he could choose to be a different person from this point on. You're gonna call yourself Saul Goodman. I think that this is something that maybe he was bound to, to try, but it didn't work out. He was in trouble almost right away, and as we know from Breaking Bad, he gets into more trouble. Do it. We ended that series as satisfyingly as we could for all of the characters. And we put the most thought into Walter White's ending because it was his story. But the idea of a redemptive ending kind of went by the wayside because he had just been so awful. But for Jimmy McGill, maybe it's possible. I don't know. Friend of the cartel, right? Right. I guess I'm harder on the character ultimately because I think he's been a part of so many awful things. He has a, a moral burden for everything that Walter White does. Can he redeem himself after all that? I wouldn't want to skirt it. At the same time, I think underneath all the nasty things he's done, there's still Jimmy McGill, who we first met, who really just wanted his place in the world. Something inside me said, you have to do this. I love the show as a totality because I also, as a fan, love watching what it says about humanity and the slow disintegrations and the small little choices that lead us to where we go. It's usually not something big. It's usually a series of things, a crooked line. And then you find yourself saying, how did I get here? I've been around a long time and this has been as fortunate as you could possibly get. You know, this is my 54th year since I got my first paycheck. And to go out this way with this show and Breaking Bad, you know, oh, come on, how lucky did I get? I got very lucky. Obviously, as an actor, it's a dream gig, but I'm also a fan of the show and how deep and rich the character work is and the storytelling is on this show. The degree to which Better Call Saul trusts its audience to care on a deep level about these people is a uh, trust exercise I would hesitate to do uh, on my own. Uh, I'm just in the best possible place you could be. I'm gonna try to enjoy it and appreciate it for as long as it lasts, which is one more season.